Okay, good morning, folks. Thanks for coming in so early this morning. My name is Robert Capers, and I'm the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. With me today, in this rather large group that I have flanking me, are to my left, Kenneth Blanco. He's the Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, for the Department of Justice's Criminal Division. To my right is Southern District of Florida U.S. Attorney Wilfredo Ferrer. Um, we have uh, Art Wyatt, who is in the audience. He's the Chief of Narcotic and Dangerous Drugs, uh, which is a section within the Department of Justice. Uh, to my left, we have Special Agent in Charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration's New York office, James J. Hunt. Uh, to his left, we have Angel Melendez, who is the uh, Special Agent in Charge of Homeland Security Investigations, New York Field Office. We have uh, Charles Dunn, who is the U.S. Marshal for the Eastern District of New York. We have Bill Sweeney, who's the Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI's New York Office. We have Commissioner James O'Neill from the New York City Police Department. Chief of Detectives Robert Boyce. Uh, we have Captain James Murphy from the New York State Police. There's Art Wyatt there a number of AUSAs and trial attorneys from the various offices on the far left and the far right. <clears throat> For well over a decade, federal prosecutors from across the United States, together with our law enforcement partners, have tirelessly investigated the criminal activities of Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Lera, also known commonly as Chapo Guzman, the leader of the Sinaloa cartel, which is based in Mexico. The Sinaloa cartel is responsible for distributing hundreds of thousands of kilograms of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and marijuana throughout the United States. And in turn, uh, the cartel has reaped billions of dollars in profits. And today marks a milestone in our pursuit of Chapo Guzman, as I'm pleased to announce the extradition of Chapo Guzman to the United States from Mexico. Mr. Uh, Guzman will be arraigned later today in the United States District Court right here in Brooklyn on a 17-count sweeping indictment, which charges him with, among other things, leading a continuing criminal enterprise, or CCE, which covers his alleged drug trafficking activity from late 1989 through September of 2014, and culminates with his ruthless leadership of the Sinaloa cartel. The charge also contains multiple violations that allege, among other things, that Mr. Guzman used corruption and violence to maintain control of his organization and conspired to, mur to murder rivals of the Sinaloa cartel. Now, in addition to the CCE charges, Mr. Guzman will be arraigned on 16 additional charges that include drug importation and distribution, the illegal use of firearms in relation to his drug, drug trafficking activities, and money laundering conspiracy related to the billions of dollars in bulk cash that his organization amassed as drug proceeds and smuggled back across the border from the United States to Mexico. In fact, the indictment also contains a notice of the government's intent to obtain a $14 billion criminal forfeiture order against him. Now, the indictment that I believe was circulated this morning, which was filed here in the Eastern District of New York and Brooklyn, represents the combined efforts of the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, this office, the Southern District of Florida and Miami, and the Narcotic and Dangerous Drug Section of the Department of Justice. The continuing criminal enterprise charges that, uh, that I will describe for you by itself attributes to Mr. Guzman cocaine shipments of over 200 tons, which were supplied by some of Colombia's most powerful drug trafficking organizations, and links Guzman to over seven and a half tons of cocaine and heroin that were seized in the United States, including four tons that were seized right here in this district, in Brooklyn, Queens, and in Long Island. So who is Chapo Guzman? Well, as alleged in the indictment, Guzman's story is not one of a do-gooder or a Robin Hood, or even one of a famous escape artist who miraculously escaped from Mexican prisons on multiple occasions. Rather, the allegations in the indictment make clear that over the course of decades, Guzman's destructive and murderous rise 
as an international narcotics trafficker is akin to that of a small cancerous tumor that metastasized and grew into a full-blown scourge that for decades littered the streets of Mexico with the casualties of violent drug wars over turf. And the same scourge helped to perpetrate the drug epidemic here in the US and make such cities as Miami and New York ground zero for that epidemic in the 1980s and 1990s, and finally culminated in his emergence as a partner with such notable Colombian cartels as the Norte Valle, Don Lucho, and Cifuentes Villa organizations, all of whom lined their pockets with cash made on the misery of millions of Americans who became addicted to their poisonous drugs. Now, as a reference point, going back to the 1980s, the drug trade in New York and Miami was controlled by Colombian cartels, including Pablo uh, uh, Escobar's Medellin cartel, the Cali cartel, and the Norte Valle cartel. The Colombians were responsible for producing, transporting, and distributing the drugs. But the drug lords relied on Mexican drug traffickers to transport their cocaine shipments north, mostly through the southwestern border of the United States. Guzman in the late 1980s was just one of, the Mexican, uh, one of the many Mexican drug transporters. But he set himself apart from the others by getting shipments to California, Texas, and Arizona much, much faster than his competition. In fact, so much quicker that he earned the name, the nickname, El Rapido. As Guzman's reputation as a transporter grew, the Colombians were willing to pay him higher fees, which meant his wealth grew and so did his power in Mexico. He forged alliances with some of Mexico's most prominent drug traffickers, including Mayo Zambada, who was a co-defendant in his indictment, and they made grabs together for other drug cartels' drug territory. And the result of that were bloody turf wars that became bloodbaths in Mexico, even claiming the life of a cardinal of a Catholic church who was killed during a gun battle at Guadalajara Airport in 1993. Guzman was arrested after that cardinal's killing and spent the next eight years in a maximum security prison, but that didn't stop the cancer from growing. And with the assistance of his brother and joining forces with the Beltran Labor Drug Organization, Guzman was able to still expand his trafficking empire from behind prison walls. And after he escaped from that prison in 2001 by allegedly hiding in a laundry cart, Guzman built his drug trafficking empire in earnest. Hiding out in his home state of Sinaloa, he created an army of heavily armed bodyguards and covertly com communicated with his network through sophisticated encrypted networks and layers of go-betweens. Now around the same time, the Colombian drug trade was also undergoing a momentous shift. The efforts of U.S. law enforcement led to the extraditions to the U.S. of countless Colombians. And so the Colombians sought to take on less risk by allowing the Mexican traffickers to assume that risk, invest in their loads, and bring those drug shipments here to the United States. And traffickers like Guzman quickly established drug distribution networks in the United States from coast to coast. Guzman increased his profits at staggering levels. The Sinaloa footprint grew as Guzman expanded his control of Atlanta, Atlantic and Pacific ports, the control of border towns between the US in Mexico and other Central American countries. And like an ambitious chief executive officer, Guzman sent Sinaloa cartel henchmen to Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador to negotiate directly with traffickers in the supply chain. He also diversified his portfolio by distributing methamphetamine, which by, which by the early 2000s gained great popularity here in the States. Meanwhile, Guzman kept an army of sicarios, or hitmen, at the ready to protect his empire from rivals or potential witnesses with extreme violence. Guzman himself was known to carry a gold-plated AK-47 assault rifle and a diamond-encrusted handgun. Violent wars under his watch erupted in Mexico against such rivals as the Ariano Felix, Vicente Carrillo, and later with the Gulf Cartel and its armed faction, Los Zetas. And as Guzman's notoriety reached incredible levels, the manhunt for him intensified in Mexico. 
And with great assistance from the United States, he was captured in 2014 in Mazatlan. And at that time when he was captured, he controlled transportation and distribution of cocaine from South America to Canada. Now, Guzman's legend grew with his second escape through a tunnel dug beneath the prison in 2015. But with great US efforts again, he was recaptured last January, setting in motion a legal process that has brought him to answer uh, these charges today in Brooklyn. So who is Chapo Guzman? In short, he's a man known for no other life than a life of crime, violence, death, and destruction. And now he'll have to answer to that. That's who Chapo Guzman is. Now, as alleged in the indictment, as the leader of this continuing, enterprise, this continuing criminal enterprise, Guzman faces a sentence of a mandatory life imprisonment, if convicted, and faces maximum sentences of life on the remaining drug trafficking crimes. Now, today's action is a testament to the tireless efforts of federal prosecutors in the Eastern District of New York, the Narcotic and Dangerous Drug Section, and the Southern District of Florida, as well as agents and law enforcement officers in the Drug Enforcement Administration, Homeland Security Investigations, and FBI offices around the country. And I want to thank them all for their part. I also want to acknowledge the tremendous efforts by the prosecutors and the U.S. Attorney's offices in El Paso, Texas, San Diego, California, Chicago, across the river in Manhattan, and New Hampshire for their excellent work and the effort that they put into developing cases against Chapo Guzman as well. I also want to partic uh, mention with particularity the extraordinary work performed by the prosecutors and law enforcement officers in assisting in the Mexican government's capture of Guzman in 2014 as well as his recapture in January 2016. I also want to thank the efforts of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Homeland Security Investigations, the New York City Police Department, and the New York State Police for ensuring Guzman's safe transport last night from MacArthur Airport to jail and ultimately to face his long date with destiny, and that is justice here in the Eastern District of New York. I also want to thank the United States Marshal Service who will ensure that Mr. Guzman is held securely to face those charges. I want to thank U.S. Attorney Wilfredo Ferrer, along with Art Wyatt, who's to the left, Chief of Narcotic and Dangerous Drug, for their partnership, steadfast support, and devotion of resources to this investigation and prosecution. And I also want to thank Dag Blanco for his guidance and his unwavering support through years and years of this investigation and prosecution that culminated today. And finally, I'd like to thank the Mexican authorities for their assistance in securing Mr. Guzman's presence in the United States for prosecution. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Southern District U.S. Attorney Ferrer for more details. Thank you, U.S. Attorney uh, Capers. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wilfredo Ferrer, and I am the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida in Miami, a district and a community that just like Brooklyn and many other communities around the world and in the United States have seen firsthand the devastating effects of a drug organization led like uh, we've seen today by Guzman. And today's announcement I think demonstrates exactly what U.S. Attorney Capers said. It shows the resolve of the United States government to make sure and charge these international drug trafficking organizations that destroy our communities. And I think that today's announcement also shows the strength that we have when we partner up, like we have done in Miami, in Brooklyn, with the trial attorneys at the Department of Justice, and with the Mexican government and all the investigative agencies. Now, U.S. Attorney Capers gave you a wonderful summary of, and a very important detailed account of what we are jointly announcing in these charges today. I want to focus my remarks today on the geographic reach of the Sinaloa cartel under Guzman's leadership. The footprint of the Sinaloa cartel expanded exponentially under the leadership of Guzman because they assumed the risk of both transporting narcotic shipments over the Mexican-American border and they also were in charge of distributing these narcotics throughout the United States. Now first, in order to ensure that his narcotics reached the destination safely, Guzman and the Sinaloa cartel took control of countless ports in southern Mexico. Then, 
To ensure that the transportation went smoothly, Guzman then expanded his presence in many countries, such as Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Panama, and Belize. And in these countries, Guzman's people were there to accept the drugs. And they transported it over land by tractor trailers, and they used every other method possible to get these drugs into, into people's hands by air, by landing on secret clandestine landing strips established by the Sinaloa cartel, and they reverted back to the method of using small planes to transport the drugs. And I want to, again, you know, in this prosecution, in this charge, I want to also thank the attorneys, the prosecutors that we have here, um, and this incredible show of force, because this would not have been done if, not, if these men and women didn't work night and day. Now, as Guzman transported these drugs and had this vast network, he didn't stop just at the southern Mexican border and in the countries in Central America. He continued his expansion further south by embedding his cartel members in South American source countries, including not only just Colombia, but also Ecuador and Venezuela. And this allowed Guzman an unprecedented ability to negotiate directly with the traffickers in the supply chain. But again, just controlling the transportation network and working directly with the suppliers was just not enough for Guzman Loera. Under his watchful eye, members of the Sinaloa cartel established then distribution networks throughout numerous U.S. cities, including but not limited right here in Brooklyn, in Atlanta, in Miami, in Chicago, in El Paso, in San Diego, in Los Angeles, and Phoenix. Guzman made every effort to ensure that the drugs were distributed across the United States until the streets of our cities and the surrounding rural areas were flooded in the entire, throughout the entire United States, flooded with his illicit drugs, which we all know destroy communities, families, and in many times it robs the futures of a lot of our children. Now let's talk about the methods. How Guzman did this, how he managed to flood the United States with Sinaloa narcotics from South America and Mexico was nothing short of an intricate and extensive transportation network that included the use of aircraft, trains, tractor trailers, and any type of boat imaginable, including those go-fast boats, container ships, fishing vessels, yachts, and even submarines. And it wasn't just the methods of transportation that were all-inclusive. Guzman's cartel, under his leadership, devised countless ways to hide the drugs and the money that they made from the drug trade. And they did it by many different ingenious ways. And they hid them inside a lot of the vehicles that they used. And for instance, members of the cartel used tanker trucks that were specially outfitted with hidden compartments in order to store the drugs and to hide them from law enforcement detection. And infamously, as we have all seen under Guzman's leadership, members of his cartel built sophisticated and elaborate tunnels under the border that were used to smuggle the drugs into the United States. And establishing this complex transportation system, along with the intricate money laundering infrastructure that he used to hide his narcotics and money, is what really helped Guzman to be one of the most infamous, successful, and notorious drug traffickers of our time. And his answer for all of his criminal activities, however, is now. And I cannot thank, again, the partnership with U.S. Attorney Capers and the Department of Justice for doing this uh, this way and doing it together. And ahora unas cuantas palabras en español. Mi nombre es Wilfredo Ferrer y yo soy el fiscal federal del Distrito Sur de la Florida. Y como el fiscal federal Capers indicó en, en su discurso, los cargos en la acusación contra Guzmán Loera indican que él aterrorizó a comunidades en todo el mundo. Estamos hoy aquí porque Joaquín El Chapo Guzmán enfrentará cargos tras su extradición a los Estados Unidos desde México. Y él fue acusado de operar una empresa criminal continua y otros delitos relacionados con las drogas a través de la organización criminal conocida como el cartel de Sinaloa. 
y de la cual él era el líder principal. Y los cargos en la acusación presentada contra Guzmán serán enjuiciados tanto por la Fiscalía Federal de Brooklyn como por la Fiscalía Federal del Sur de la Florida. Ambas oficinas trabajarán con la sección de narcóticos y drogas peligrosas de la División Criminal del Departamento de Justicia. Las acusaciones, en breve, indican que entre enero del 1989 hasta diciembre del 1014, Guzmán Loera fue la cabeza de una vasta empresa criminal responsable por la importación en los Estados Unidos y la distribución de grandes cantidades de narcóticos ilegales. También Guzmán conspiró para asesinar a las personas que representaban una amenaza para su siniestro negocio de narcotráfico. Los cargos también indican que Guzmán usó armas de fuego para llevar a cabo transacciones relacionadas con su tráfico de drogas ilegales y con el lavado de dinero, mediante al cual hizo un contrabando masivo de más de 14 mil millones de dólares. Todo este dinero provenía de la venta ilegal del narcotráfico en los Estados Unidos y en Canadá. Y como parte de la investigación se han incautado más de 200 mil kilos de cocaína vinculados al cartel de Simaloa. Y según se indica en la acusación y los documentos presentados en la corte, Guzmán Loera e Ismael Zambada García eran los líderes del cartel de Sinaloa y conspiraban para importar más de 200 toneladas métricas de cocaína en los Estados Unidos. La cocaína era transportada desde Colombia por medio de aviones, barcos, submarinos hacia puertos controlados por el cartel de Sinaloa y en el sur de México y en otros lugares de Centroamérica. Y a partir de ahí, los narcotráficos y los narcóticos y las drogas eran enviados a través de México para centros de distribución en los Estados Unidos. Como uno de los principales líderes del cartel de Sinaloa, Guzmán era el encargado de supervisar todo el proceso de contrabando ilegal de cocaína, heroína y otras drogas a distribuidores en Nueva York, Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, así como en Arizona, Los Ángeles y otros lugares. La huella geográfica del cartel de Sinaloa aumentó de una manera exponencial bajo el liderazgo de Guzmán porque los traficantes asumían el riesgo del transporte de los narcotráficos y los narcóticos a través de la frontera entre México y los Estados Unidos y la distribución de las drogas con los Estados Unidos también. Pero él también amplió su imperio ilegal con una presencia en Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Panamá y Belice. Y en estos países centroamericanos, los empleados de Guzmán aceptaban los envíos de cocaína que les llegaban por tierra, por mar y por aire. Pero Guzmán no paró ahí. Él también continuó su expansión más hacia el sur, en Colombia, Ecuador y Venezuela, para que los miembros del cartel pudieran negociar directamente con los narcotraficantes en el país donde se cultivaban las drogas. Y como líder del cartel de Sinaloa, Guzmán fue el responsable de inundar a los Estados Unidos con drogas que venían desde México y desde Sudamérica usando una red de transporte intricada y extensa. Establecer este complejo sistema de transporte sobre una infraestructura intricada para ocultar sus, narco, sus narcóticos y el dinero lavado, esas fueron las, las, las razones que a, ayudó a Guzmán a convertirse en uno de los narcotraficantes más peligroso del tiempo. Pero ahora Guzmán tiene que contestar la llamada de la justicia y pagar por todos sus crímenes. Muchas gracias. Next will be Deputy Assistant Attorney General Ken Blanco. Thank you. Good morning. This is a great day for everyone who believes in the rule of law and everybody who believes in justice. I want to thank you all for coming here today. I want to thank uh, U.S. Attorney Capers and U.S. Attorney Ferrer and all of those people up here who've done such a great job in working this tireless case uh, and for dedicating and for the sacrifice that they have made. I'm not going to give an overview, the excellent overview that uh, USA Capers and USA uh, Ferrer gave, but I do want to strike uh, a very important issue here uh, because this is also a great day for all of those who believe in international cooperation. 
And I have a few comments on that. I want to thank the Mexican government for their cooperation in this matter, for their tireless efforts, for their commitment to justice, and for the many sacrifices made by them, in particular, their law enforcement personnel, many of whom have paid the ultimate price for their work over the years. This extradition would not have been possible without the strong, efficient, close cooperation we have in our working relationship with our Mexican counterparts. I want to thank, in particular, President Enrique Peña Nieto, Secretary of Foreign Affairs Luis Viragray Caso, and Attorney General Raul Cervantes Andrate for their unwavering support in this matter and their commitment to justice. Un fuerte agradecimiento a nuestros hermanos y amigos de México. Thank you so much. Next will be Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent in Charge for New York, James Hunt. Good morning. To reiterate re my peers' sentiments, this extradition is a significant victory for the U.S. law enforcement at all levels, the U.S. and Mexico. It's often said, and it's a misnomer, that law enforcement, we don't get the big fish. Well, Joaquin Guzman's arrival in the U.S. shows that we always do. All these international drug lords either end up dead by the hand of their own people or foreign law enforcement or end up in U.S. prisons. I hope this brings to attention the problem at hand, and that is that 144 people who die every day in the U.S. from substance misuse. And I hope this sends a message to drug traffickers that with law enforcement collaboration, you will be brought to justice. Lastly, I want to thank our partners who assisted us, members of the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, the numerous DEA divisions worldwide, Homeland Security Investigations, the FBI, Customs Border Patrol, U.S. Marshal Service, the NYPD, New York State Police, and all the prosecutors, Eastern District, Florida, NDDS, and around the country. Thank you. Next up will be Homeland Security Investigations Special Agent in Charge, Angel Melendez. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Capers. Um, good morning. My name is Angel Melendez. I'm the Special Agent in Charge for ICE's Homeland Security Investigations. I want to start by mentioning that for the past 20 years, any investigation into transnational crime had some way, shape, or form a link into the Sinaloa cartel, specifically into the tentacles of Joaquin Guzman El Chapo. We started out looking at the, the Mexican Federation, which was basically a collaborative effort between the Sinaloa cartel and the Beitron Leva cartel. And as they started to war, it provided us the opportunities to start picking these cartels apart and bringing to justice the leaders of those organizations. As you heard throughout today, throughout this morning, specifically as you read the indictment, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is being charged with smuggling over 200 tons of cocaine and laundering what would be the equivalent of the gross national product of many countries around the world. This is a powerful individual, a powerful criminal, the most notorious criminal of modern times. Last night, some of us had the opportunity to see him arrive at the airport. And as he deplaned, the most notorious criminal of modern time, as you looked into his eyes, you can see the surprise. You can see the shock. And to a certain extent, you can actually see the fear. As the realization started to kick in that he's about to face American justice. And he's about to face American justice in a city that's foundation is bedrock. As strong as the will of the citizens that live in this city. And I assure you, no tunnel will be built leading to his bathroom. I have to thank 
all of our partners here in the United States, but also globally. Because today is a great day for all of law enforcement. A couple of words in Spanish. Hoy es un gran día para la agencia de ley y orden a través del mundo. Porque a través de la, co de la colaboración de los países y de los Estados Unidos es que hoy estamos anunciando la extradición significante del criminal más notorio de nuestros tiempos. Y una de las cosas que yo estaba mencionando en inglés es que anoche la persona que llegó a Nueva York no era ese criminal tan notorio y tan poderoso. Era, una, era un criminal que tenía una cara de perplejo, de asombro. Y es porque la realidad de que él se va a enfrentar a la justicia norteamericana lo hacía temblar porque en esta ciudad no hay túnel que valga yo le quiero agradecer una vez más a todos nuestros compañeros agencias de ley y orden a través del mundo específicamente al gobierno de México por hacer este gran día una realidad muchas gracias thank you so much Next will be uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Assistant Director in Charge for New York, Bill Sweeney. Thank you, Rob. Good morning. When the FBI conducts an investigation into a large criminal organization, our goal is to take out the leadership, to create a void, and to create chaos in the ranks so it becomes harder to traffic their drugs and guns and to hold that leadership accountable. After many years of work, FBI special agents, analysts, and professionals from across field offices across the country, work side by side with law enforcement agencies represented by those standing with us today. We will now finish that job together and put one of the most feared and dangerous drug traffickers in the world in U.S. federal prison permanently. As explained a few minutes ago, Guzman ruled an iron fist in Mexico, creating a worldwide empire using murder, intimidation, and bribery to remain at the top. We will use the intelligence we collected to go after those that remain. We want the investigation against Guzman and his extradition to serve as a lesson to all those aiming to replace him. We are willing and we are capable of using our extensive resources and partnerships to continue to go after the leadership of these cartels and to make them pay for their deadly and destructive actions in this country. I'd like to thank our law enforcement partners, especially the DEA, HSI, the Marshal Service, the State Police, the New York PD, all of whom are represented up here, the prosecutors, and countless other agencies around the country for their dedication, their professionalism, and their partnership. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the FBI professionals from our offices around the globe who have been investigating Guzman for years. Your work in countering his deadly organization makes a difference. The tremendous time, the effort, and the personal sacrifices that you have made to bring Guzman to justice have been nothing short of exceptional. Thank you. Next will be Commissioner James O'Neill, New York City Police Department. Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, USA uh, Attorney Farrar. Thank you for everything that you do uh, on this case, everything you did on this case, and everything you guys done do to keep this country safe and the city safe. I just want to highlight the incredible work the members of the Drug Enforcement Task Force have done here and continue to do every day in other cases. The NYPD, the DEA, and the New York State Police working with Homeland Security and the U.S. Marshals and the FBI, who continue to be our great partners in so many efforts. NYPD detectives and the task force have been on this for years. Thousands of miles travel all across the United States and Central America and Mexico to take investigative steps and conduct close to 100 interviews. All of this shows that we, along with our local, state, and federal partners, never shelve an unfinished case. Chapo Guzman is back on our soil now where he can finally be brought to justice for his many years of criminal behavior. Moving hundreds of metric tons of narcotics into the U.S., behavior that's affected so many people here in New York City and beyond for so many years. Again, thank you very much for all the work that was done in this case. Thank you. Questions, folks? Could you talk a little bit about how the decision was made to bring the case to Brooklyn as opposed to another federal jurisdiction? 
Sure. So there were, as you well know, I believe, multiple jurisdictions in the U U.S. attorney community that were investigating Chapo Guzman, including Southern District of Florida, Narcotic and Dangerous Drug, us, uh, the Northern District of Illinois, Southern District of California, Western District of Texas, uh, and after an exhaustive review of um, uh, all of the various cases, um, it was determined that the partnership that had been formed between our district, the Southern District of Florida, and Narcotic and Dangerous Drug brought the most forceful punch uh, in the way of a case. Uh, we have uh, a, co a combined uh, 11 or 12 seasoned narcotics prosecutors who have uh, devoted their careers uh, to this war uh, on narcotics. Uh, we have, working with our partners, amassed a formidable case, including some 40 or so uh, witnesses um, who provide uh, you know, an intricate uh, look into uh, this organization, the devastation that was wrought, uh, and it was decided that that would be the most effective way to bring all the forces of the United States government to bear uh, in bringing him to justice. I'm actually going to defer the first part of that question to Dag Blanco. We were notified uh, yesterday that he would be on his way to the United States. So um, although it was not a surprise that the extradition was requested because we have been asking for his extradition, uh, we did not know that it was going to happen yesterday, but um, we had made those plans in advance. Uh, we felt confident in our request for extradition. Um, and um, he was delivered just to, yesterday to us, I believe, aboard a Mexican um, um, police plane, I believe. Uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. And with respect to the second question, uh, we can't comment on um, any statements he did or did not make uh, with reference to his trip over. Two questions, sir. Do you, does anybody here think it was politically motivated, the timing? And the second question is, what extra precautions are being taken to ensure he stays in custody? Uh, we actually won't even speculate uh, as to the first part. Uh, what we know, as Dag Blanco has, uh, has just stated, is that the extradition process had been um, in process, forgive me for using the same word twice, for some period of time, um, and that there was um, a lot going on in that process. Um, we were unaware that it was going to happen, but we were ready uh, for it, uh, having planned for it. Uh, with regards to the second part, we're not going to comment. Well, for um, uh, security and safety purposes, we're not going to comment on that, sir. Okay. The uh, forfeiture of 14 billion, roughly how much of that do we have eyes on? How much visibility, how much will we be able to get? Do we know where he's put this money? Just what are the prospects for collecting some significant amount of that? Uh, we can't say what the prospects are. It's a notice of what the government is going to seek. Uh, there has, uh, I can say, been an extensive investigation uh, that has spanned years uh, that allows us to um, come up with a number for which the, we make that allegation. We can't say how much we have eyes on or how much we'll recover, uh, but what we do know is that the government will be vigilant uh, in trying to recover as many as those, as much of those assets as we can. Okay. Yes. Well, he'll have to make that decision uh, with his attorney about whether he wants to give us any information. But we can't, obviously, at this point, comment on that. Um, it's just what we stated in our, in our accusations and in our allegations in, in the indictment, which is that he had this extensive network in Central America, in South America, and throughout the United States. And this investigation will uh, reveal that as the, as the case proceeds. En español... Eh, le pudiera decir que en este momento no sabemos si el uh, señor Guzmán Loera va a cooperar o dar información. Eso es algo que él tiene que decidir con su abogado y en ese momento entonces eh, sabremos. Pero en este momento no tenemos esa información. 
Yes, in the, in the back, the, sir. Um, the type of witnesses, how high level in the organization do they have, and will Sean Penn be one of those? Well, we, we, we can't, uh, for obvious reasons, describe uh, the witnesses. We can say that the, the caliber of witnesses are strong and great. They will provide, uh, should there be a trial, um, a very detailed and intricate look inside the inner workings of the organization, its rise, uh, and what we believe is its ultimate demise. How long do you think a trial like this would actually last? Um, with uh, right now approximately 40 or more witnesses um, uh, and the admission of what we believe is going to be volumes of evidence, it would take multiple weeks. Uh, it would depend on a lot of variables, including the court schedule, um, but we believe that it would be a many weeks trial. He doesn't face any charge for the death penalty. Is that a prerequisite to getting the Mexicans to agree to extradition? As part of the uh, extradition process, we had to assure the Mexican government uh, that the death penalty would not be sought in this matter. So he is, uh, as it stands, uh, if he's convicted of the CCE, he's facing a mandatory life sentence. And for all of the narcotics-related, uh, narcotics trafficking sentences, he is also facing a maximum sentence of life. Why is Brooklyn the best venue for his indictment? Um, because it's Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't pass that up. Um, <laughs> uh, there are many venues. We believe that Brooklyn, uh, this office, uh, and the evidence that we have provided the greatest um, uh, opportunity for us to uh, conduct this prosecution. As I noted in my remarks as well, there was a multi, uh, there are several multi-ton seizures of uh, narcotics, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, that occurred here in this district uh, in various parts, including Brooklyn and Long Island. Basically, everything is going to be concentrated here. That, because there are so many places around the states, everything is going to be held in Brooklyn. Well, and second, in that case, what is going to be the permanent facilities? Because we know this guy is dangerous and he escaped twice. Mm, can you tell us a little bit more what are the arrangements in the future? Because well, it is going to be a, a, comp a comprehensive presentation um, about uh, the, uh, the Sinaloa cartels, uh, the rise and the fall of it, uh, including um, volumes and volumes of testimony and evidence that will be admitted about uh, narcotics activities that occurred uh, throughout the country, throughout the districts that we cited. Uh, including and beginning with uh, the purchasing of these loads of uh, drugs and the, its transportation through Mexico across the border into the states. So it's going to be a comprehensive presentation. It's not going to be exclusively focused on activity that occurred here. It will encompass activity in the Southern District of Florida, uh, uh, in the Eastern District of New York, uh, and, and some of, and many of the other districts that we spoke of. This is also a process, so as we get closer to trial, we will, we will decide what evidence will be admitted, but it will be a complete and comprehensive, um, uh, if it is a trial, presentation of evidence. With regards to your second uh, question, uh, for security reasons, we really can't discuss um, any details with regards to where he'll be housed, if he's convicted uh, and sentenced uh, to his mandatory life sentence, where he would be sentenced there. What we can do is assure you that uh, what occurred in other countries will not occur here. He will remain in United States custody. Well, that means that he will be arraigned in other states as well? Will he be transported later to Miami? We are here, we're here to announce this indictment. Uh, he, this indictment has been unsealed. Uh, he has been extradited here for the purpose of uh, answering these charges. No decisions have been made with regards to anything else. Oh, excuse me. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, it's also to say that just so you asked the question about Miami, th this is a joint indictment um, that uh, with using the vast evidence from Brooklyn and then adding the resources and the sort of witnesses that we also got in Miami together with the attorneys at the Department of Justice and Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. I mean, I, I, I want to emphasize that this show of force that you see here, um, the, the prosecutors, the agents from all three of these offices, uh, plus... Uh, intelligence specialists that we also have in our offices. This has been an amazing group effort, as U.S. Attorney Capers talked about, within our three 
components. We put them together, and that's why the indictment is a, is a joint one. Y en español es para decirle que este es un trabajo, una acusación que es de información y evidencia combinados del distrito de Brooklyn, el distrito de Miami y también del Departamento de Justicia, de los abogados trabajando en el Departamento de uh, Antinarcotráfico. Y es, es un trabajo, eh, so en este momento, él va a estar aquí en, en Brooklyn para el enjuiciamiento, que es una combinación de lo que, lo que tiene de evidencia en Miami, Brooklyn y en el Departamento de Justicia. O sea, que él no va a ir después a, a Miami después de este caso porque estamos unidos. O sea, es el mismo enjuiciamiento. Look, I think what you're going to learn through this case is the breadth and width of a very large drug enterprise and syndicate that not only operates with drugs, but also uses extortion and murder, money, launders money. You're going to see the full panorama of things that we have been talking about and that you have been reading about for years. That's what you're going to see in this case. You're going to see cooperation between American and Mexican justice. You're going to see cooperation with our international partners. Because as everybody knows, Chapo Guzman is not only a criminal, uh, uh, alleged criminal here in the United States, but in Mexico, but also in the world. And that's what you're going to see. Ustedes van a ver un criminal, un delincuente, que ha, tenia, que ha, ten, ha, ha tenido sus manos en todos los países. Ha hecho cosas horribles en muchos países. En este caso, ustedes van a ver la paronama de un narcotraficante y su organización. Y vas a ver muchas cosas en lo cual ustedes han solamente leído o han visto en películas. Pero este es real. Este es la vida de muchas gentes. Ustedes van a ver lo, lo que pasa cuando un delincuente tiene tanto poder y tanto dinero. Eh, ustedes van a ver lo que de verdad pasa uh, con una persona así. Eso es lo que van a ver en este caso. Y van a ver también la justicia Uh, y el, la combinación de los países que trabajan juntos y que trabajan en una manera uh, juntas con muchas objetivas que son muy importantes no solamente para estos países pero para el mundo eso es lo que vas a ver I uh, can't speak about confidence uh, about what we're going to do. I know that what we have as a department are missions to follow, and one of the missions are eradicating the scourge of drugs that are uh, stringing out and addicting um, people of all stations of life. Well, we can't speak to what will happen ultimately, but those cases currently remain open. Okay? Thank you, folks. I'm sorry. We're short on time. We have to. Can the investigation go into possible ties with U.S. Uh, banks or other enterprises? We, we can't speak to what will happen next. What we can say is the investigation continues to, to flow. Thank you. Thank you.